Jim. But I didn't know Jim very well, so. All right, let's, uh, let's get started. So after uh, a uh, one-week break for uh, Frontiers in Optics, the colloquium is back, and I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Danielle Wuchenich from the Lockheed Martin Advanced Technology Center in Palo Alto, California. Uh, and Dr. Wuchenich took her PhD in physics uh, back in 2014, was it? Uh, from, the, <laughs> yeah, from the Australian National University in Canberra, uh, a, a, a great place, the sleepiest capital city on the planet, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless a great place to visit. Um, so uh, her doctoral work focused on laser metrology techniques for space-based uh, gravitational wave detectors, uh, and she has, uh, in that capacity, worked on the LISA and uh, the GRACE um, follow-on space interferometry missions at JPL uh, in Pasadena and in Hanover. Um, and so in addition to her work at the ATC, uh, she is an entrepreneur, having co-founded uh, Light Liquid Instruments, uh, which is, uh, uh, you'll perhaps hear a little bit about that, I hope, uh, a company uh, which uh, produces high-end uh, scientific metrology instrumentation based on very flexible uh, FPGAs. Uh, and uh, she is one of the co-founders. So welcome, Danielle. Hey, thanks very much. Happy to be here. Uh, so I, I tell Michael I'm, I'd uh, put up just a little bit about me in case anybody had any questions on any of these things. I thought, what did I want to hear when I was in graduate school? Um, and I worked in quite a few different places uh, over the years, and so uh, from government labs to industry to now a startup, so I thought if, in case you have any questions, I just would flash a quick bio in case there's anything in particular that you wanted to know about from either my current life or my past life. Um, I was in uh, Australia for graduate school and doing uh, gravitational wave detector um, interferometric, uh, like metrology techniques basically for the um, space-based interferometer, or LISA, that is planned uh, to launch in I think 2032 now. It's been pushed out a little ways. Um, but as you know, with this year, the big news with LIGO, um, hopefully the funding will come back in full swing and, and LISA will actually happen in the future. So I may or may not go back to working on that. I thought that was a really cool project. Um, and then I joined Lockheed uh, two years ago after my PhD, um, and that's uh, where I've been since, and then doing part-time at my startup as well. So, uh, yeah, not a lot of sleep. <laughs> um, but just a little bit about Lockheed. Um, we are a company that's over 100 years old. Uh, we have 100, 000, nearly 100,000 employees, which you probably know. Um, 60,000 of us are uh, scientists, engineers, and IT professionals, um, almost 600 facilities across the U.S. Um, so pretty much, yeah, there's always a facility like down the road somewhere. And um, uh, something that you probably don't know is that we hire about 5% of all engineers trained across the U.S. Um, that's around 4,000 people a year. And um, just a little overview of the company. we. Uh, like this, uh, within Lockheed Martin, we have four main business areas, and essentially these are small, like smaller companies within Lockheed Martin. And so um, we kind of tease that if you were to try to change uh, divisions of the company that you work for, it's basically like getting a new job. It's that different. Um, so I work in space systems, um, which is the one in the bottom right. Um, but most of our business is between space systems and aeronautics. Um, you know, with the fighter, the fighter jets and stuff, those, are, those all happen in aeronautics, and that's kind of our high visibility products. Um, but then in space, you see a lot of our like, satellite work and stuff, too. And um, uh, so, like, focusing on, on space systems, uh, I guess um, something that uh, people have really taken for granted in, in uh, this day and age, or just how reliant we are on space systems. Um, everything from uh, GPS to, you know, even when banks do transactions, they rely on GPS to um, cell phones to cable TV. And so it really has kind of infiltrated, like, our everyday life, and it definitely will pay, play a big part in the future. Um, and so Lockheed has been around for... Oops, I did not know this animation was there. <laughs> that was a very slow animation. Um, <laughs> they, uh, Lockheed has um, really been in the, uh, you know, since the dawn of the space age, we've really been there. 
um, our fundamental uh, business is, is in building satellites, which have to um, operate in a harsh environment, um, operate with no options for maintenance. Um, you know, you can't just like take the car into the shop when something goes wrong. Um, you, you have to be maximized for energy efficiency. Um, so, you know, a lot of a, a lot of our satellites will have uh, rely on solar power. Um, be minimized for size and mass. Anything that you launch costs a lot of money. So, the smaller it is, the better. Um, even though sometimes, like for optical systems, the bigger the better. So um, that's like always these uh, constraints that kind of seem to be placed on how, what you can physically design and launch. Um, and as you can see up here, we're really building um, uh, instruments for a variety of different people and for a variety of uses. Um, and uh, whether it be uh, civil or military, commercial, um, there are some of the pictures up here, but I don't, I don't really want to go into those. Um, and underpinning all of the, the lines of business that we're in um, w is like a core set of like people, techniques, principles, um, facilities that, um, that help kind of bring all this together and, and furnish in like new ways of doing things. And that's the Advanced Technology Center, and that's where I work. And uh, the Advanced Technology Center is within Space Systems Company, and we're a 500 scientists strong, uh, we, I say small, R&D lab, um, but yeah, 500 people maybe is not that small. Um, but for a company like Lockheed Martin, it seems like a small facility. Um, and kind of our goal is really to um, come up with new architectures and uh, new technologies like that will give us some kind of advantage. So whether it's in uh, making something more lightweight or making something use less power consumption. So it's really, um, I wouldn't say that our goal is kind of a fundamental science perspective, but it's much more of like an hardcore engineering, like how can we do this better or how can we do this cheaper? How can we, we make this faster? Um, and um, so some of the things that we do, I mean, so we do uh, contracted and independent uh, research and development, and we do a lot of payloads and payload technologies. Um, we have a big group in space and earth sciences, so they do a lot of solar probes. So that's probably the only fundamental research I would say that we do at this facility. Um, a lot of classified programs. And um, because most of us uh, have advanced degrees, um, we really have uh, pretty strong university ties, especially with the University of Arizona um, and other R&D institutions and government labs um, that we work pretty closely with on a daily basis. Um, the uh, AC, ATC, uh, that's the Advanced Technology Center, technology portfolios, um, basically these are the different topic areas that I would say we have um, uh, specialties in. And with 500 people, you can imagine that we have quite a diverse er um, range of expertises. And um, so these are the kind of our no notable core competencies, if you will. Um, and something that, in, and so I'm specifically in the optics and electro-optics department, um, but we also do, um, like I said, the space sciences and instrumentation, advanced materials, um, control systems, uh, RF and photonics. You can, you can see them all. And um, it's a pretty neat place to work. Uh, I think um, in this regard, because we have, because there's so many of us and everyone's come from all the different backgrounds, um, it's really a pretty unique place, I think, as far as um, where you could have an idea and go through all of the prototyping, the concept design, the um, like testing it for flight if you wanted. Um, all of that can be done pretty much in house, um, which is yeah pretty crazy. Um, we have our, our particular facility um, has been here, like the ATC has been in Palo Alto since the 50s, and we have a really long record of of launching uh, space instruments. So I think yeah, this I'm not sure if this number is uh, completely current, but yeah, something like 180 instruments over six decades. Um, and here's like some of the, the hot topics or the recent things that we've been working on. Um, IRIS, which was a satellite that uh, launched in 2013 to uh, study uh, solar storms. Some of these things were in the news, which is why we pulled these ones out. Um, then NIRCAM, which you probably have heard, I think you heard about in your last colloquium. Um, that was a uh, collaboration with us and you guys, um, which is the primary science instrument for James Webb Space Telescope. And then Space Domain Awareness, which I'll talk a bit about. Um, the name sounds kind of lame, but it's pretty cool. So <laughs> sounds very, uh, yeah, 
space AD or something. Um, and basically that's um, what a like a capability that we're trying to develop to um, track, characterize, and track and characterize space objects, be it satellites or debris. And um, kind of the technology areas that um, I think that we spend a lot of time caring, um, time and energy uh, like caring about, I guess, is in uh, directed energy. So several of my colleagues work on directed energy programs. So these are high power laser programs um, and uh, working in the field. And so it's not just like having a high power laser in the lab. Um, once you go into a turbulent environment where things don't behave the way that you think, um, there's a lot of problems to solve, um, optical, optomechanical, and thermal, as you can imagine. Um, laser radar, um, and then advanced materials and manufacturing. And that's um, another thing that we really, uh, is, is part of our core competency that is really our bread and butter, but I don't actually know a whole bunch about. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of people that do materials. And, and you can imagine um, it's kind of something that might not um, think you would not necessarily think we would put a lot of money or time into, but um, really when you're trying to make everything better or like make your satellite last five years longer, um, these things really matter. The, the weights of the materials, the properties of the materials, um, just how resistant they are to you know corrosion to whatever whatever your environment you're putting it in. Materials kind of fundamentally underpin a lot of the things that we do, and a lot of the competitive advantages that we get really come back to the materials perspective. So big shout out to them. I'm glad we have them. <laughs> um, but we're optics people, and so um, the things that, like, these are some of the things that I care about, I guess, um, which would be tough problems impacting optical systems. And in the context of satellites, one thing like that I referred to earlier is um, reducing size, weight, and power. Mass is always a big thing when you're going to space. Um, so you want to put kind of as much capability into a satellite as you can um, without, you know, either making it bigger or making it cost more. Um, you know, whatever you put on there, you have to launch. You have to, you know, even get to the point where it's able to launch. It has to pass all of the vibe and thermal tests. Um, so that's like always, um, always a uh, um, a problem, I guess, that we're dealing with every day. Um, also, how do you make an imaging system smaller without sacrificing resolution? So that's something that I'll be talking about today. And then, not just um, in launching things to space, but like just increasing the ability to resolve um, resolve things from further away, whether it be from the ground to space or, or from the space to ground. And and as you guys know, um, there is a limit on the aperture size that you can build. Even if we didn't want to spend, send it into space, um, where the launch is really costly, just the size of the instrument that we can build, um, there are practical you know limitations, as you know. Um, Enabling the full potential of lasers. Uh, I think lasers are something that um, work really, really well in the lab, but they really haven't kind of, I think, you know, in, in this like next 30 years, we'll really see the full power of lasers be unleashed in the, you know, in the working, <laughs> working domain. Um, and so for laser communications, um, active imaging, uh, beam control is always a huge thing for us. We're in tur turbulent environments outdoors, so beam control is like always the thing on everybody's mind. Um, and then more power uh, for for a lot of the for a lot of the programs. And um, so the areas that we're addressing some hard uh, optical physics problems. Um, that I wanted to talk about today are in space debris management. So that's using lasers for space debris management. Um, sparse aperture imaging for space domain awareness. And making uh, basically uh, t imaging systems with a lower hardware uh, footprint using photonic integrated circuits. Um, so first, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures like this, but if you've ever seen a talk on um, space debris, uh, it is not pretty. <laughs> so space is getting really crowded, um, and the chance of uh, collision is increasing. So what you're seeing here is um, a picture of the Earth surrounded by all the things that um, we have cataloged that are in orbit around it. And um, note that the catalog is using um, de like debris that are ten um, over 10 centimeters. So anything smaller than that isn't even um, shown up here. And it kind of just looks like a swarm of flies, and, like you just want to brush it away <laughs> or something. Um, and there, we've had incidences of satellites crashing or colliding either with debris or with each other, um, and that only makes the problem worse. 
and the cost of maneuvering a satellite is high. Um, you know, you're basically decreasing the, the lifetime of your satellite anytime you use fuel to move out of the way or, or try to avoid a collision. So um, it's, it's actually, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a problem that's becoming more of a problem. And the need to know what, what is where, um, be able to observe, characterize, and mitigate um, the debris has really increased. Um, and of, of that swarm, um, only uh, like less than 4,000 of those objects are operational payloads. Um, and, you know, you, it's not just um, necessarily from crashes or anything. Every time you launch a satellite, um, you leave the shell of the satellite, the stages, the rocket motors. So there's a lot of junk that's just floating around, and big junk, some of it really big, um, that's floating around up there that I guess you don't really think about. Um, but unfortunately, um, it's, it's starting to become a problem. And um, you might say, well, I mean, as a spacecraft provider, Lockheed Martin Space Systems Company obviously cares about protecting our operational satellites. Um, but for everybody else, it's like, well, is it really that big of a deal? And I think, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's going to become a problem, especially because of how reliant um, our society, you know, current technology or current society is on, on these systems. Um, and there's a potential for debris on debris collisions. So sure we could, um, if we know that a piece of debris is coming toward one of our operational satellites, we could move it out of the way and say, all right, phew, you know, this one's gonna keep going for a little while longer. Um, but what happens when you don't have anything that you can control? What happens when it's to either um, non-operational satellites or a piece of debris with a non-operational satellite? You have no control. Um, like there's literally nothing you can do. And um, there's this, uh, this plot on the bottom right um, called the Kessler syndrome. Um, there's basically the potential um, for debris on debris collisions to actually just continue to happen to the extent where it's a runaway problem and there's literally nothing we can do about it. And right now, the debris problem is um, challenging pretty much all like orbital layers of where we want to have our satellites. So it's, it's definitely not just only an issue in LEO or in, or in GEO, it's, it's really something that um, is starting to become a problem in all orbital layers. Um, so one thing that we've been uh, um, involved, a project that we've been involved with, um, has been this NASA Light Force com um, concept. So it's a little, um, it's, it's not very uh, exciting and as far as it's not like you're, you know, shooting a harpoon and pulling something back or anything. Um, nothing as extreme as that. But, you know, if you really think, I mean, if you really think about the problem, how would you get these huge things that are, um, you know, moving around completely uncontrolled down? And um, it's a problem that no one really has solved. And so if you have any ideas, you should be thinking about this. And so um, NASA's light force concept, instead of like just trying to you know, shoot it out of the sky or something, which just isn't really practical, um, is to use, to use a, a giant laser on the ground um, to put just a little bit of radiation pressure, like photon pressure, onto whatever debris um, or thing that you're trying to move. And if you hit it in its orbit as it's coming over, the horizon, if you kind of hit it um, in, its, in its orbit, um, you can impart enough, like, impart enough momentum that, um, uh, that over the course of several days of maybe hitting it just a little bit, you can um, nudge it. And you might only be nudging it by like millimeters to centimeters. Um, but over the course of its, um, over many passes and over the course of several days, it could actually change its trajectory or where it goes in its orbit by hundreds of meters. And so this would be a way of um, basically trying to um, get, like, avoid some collisions that maybe you wouldn't have a lot of other options for uh, otherwise. And, you know, right now it's probably not going to work with, you know, very large things. It's probably only going to work with really small pieces of debris. But, hey, you've got to start somewhere, especially if, as the problem could get potentially really bad. And so um, that's kind of something that we've been uh, starting to think about. So like I said, you can, you know, eventually you can get 100 meters of a potential shift. Um, in order for this to really work well, though, practically, um, you first require really good conjunction analysis um, and mitigate, like, yeah, and conjunction prediction. So um, basically when the Iridium Cosmos satellites um, collided, they, uh, they, one of them was a working satellite, one of them was not a working satellite, and so um, it was like a, a way up of how close are we going to get, and the information that they had said no, they would miss by however many meters or I think a half a kilometer is what, what they thought they would miss by, and they didn't. And so that's pretty bad. I mean, you'd think, in, you know, we would be able to do a little better with, like, you know, where things are and where they're going. 
Um, it turns out that's not so easy. People that work in um, orbit, orbit propagations, like it's apparently not, not an easy problem. Um, one, because of all these non-conservative forces, uh, but I guess it's just like they're doing better and better, but it's not a solved problem by any means. And so for these guys, had they just had a better analysis of like where it was going to be, they, they, they would have known that actually they're going to be, they're going to hit. And so they, you know, they, it, the, the result would have been very different had, I think, the conjunction analysis been better. So we also need to know, you know, where it's going. And so um, improve orbit propagation um, um, analysis. And then also um, being able to track where they are. So right now um, there's a limitation using radar systems um, of how, you know, how well you know where the objects even are. And so um, the laser um, and laser LADAR systems that are coming online give you really good, um, give you really good resolution of where your object actually is. And so once you know where it is, then you can put that into your orbit and, um, analysis models and then figure out maybe where it's going to go. But only a few days out. I mean, you can't, if you try to do an or orbital analysis like weeks out, it's just not going to be very accurate. So in order to actually keep a very good um, like understanding of where these things are, you have to constantly be cataloging and pinging where these little things are. And and then continually updating, is there going to be a collision or not? Um, and then another thing, um, like to get all of this actually working, if, if there's radiation pressure, light, um, uh, light force thing would actually work, would be to, um, you would need good beam control. So once we actually have a you know, gigantic laser that we're ready to shoot at the piece of debris, um, you have to go through a turbulent environment to get it to, to the object that's so far away. And as it goes through the atmosphere, it's not like you're going to be focusing necessarily a lot of power on there. So being able to use adaptive optics and, um, and uh, like even feed forward algorithms so you actually know, like, so you actually deliver the most um, power possible to the target is important. Um, and so that's something that a lot of my colleagues kind of like deal with, I guess, on a, on a daily level. Um, we have a, a facility in Santa Cruz, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, which is not too, like 20 minutes uh, or yeah, 20 miles from San Jose, but um, it's so kind of a windy, mountainy road, so it takes a little longer than 20 minutes. And um, it's uh, lucky it has a property that's uh, 3,600 acres. And we do a lot of our field t testing out there. And it's one of my favorite places to work because you're overlooking the Pacific Ocean and there's like deer there and it's all trees. It's, it's really great. And uh, that's like the best day in the office for sure. <laughs> and um, so that's where we're doing some of this work. Um, some of the other things that we're really caring about, this is like this idea of space domain awareness. And that's really like um, not just satellite tracking, but also debris tracking, having a really good understanding of like what is where and, um, and what is it. And so that's something that we, um, we've been working on. We have one of these satellite tracking and, and illumination radar tra trailers called STILT that one of my colleagues works on. And then SPOT, which is the space object tracking, tracking facility. And this is these uh, telescopes, these three moving telescopes on the bottom right that you can see. They're uh, meter telescopes and mobile domes. And Michael Hart's group actually built the adaptive optic systems for these, uh, for these uh, telescopes. And so um, a lot of the focus of what uh, my group is, or the group that I'm in is doing, is, is um, working on kind of developing these next generation systems that are really um, capable for this space domain awareness. And so whether that's in passive imaging, active imaging, um, interferometric and distributed aperture, so you can um, get higher resolution than you could with just a single telescope. And um, I'll get into some of that in a little bit. But uh, first, uh, just typical seeing um, the r, &R is OK um, at, the, at the Santa Cruz facility. We um, typically are running from uh, March through October. So everything's kind of winding down there uh, now for the rest of the year. And um, our r nuts are between 5 and 10 centimeters. Um, uh, but one thing that I think was really cool, so um, in addition to just trying to do like traditional imaging, um, is uh, as like kind of developing technologies where you can do a fingerprinting of satellites um, from the ground that you wouldn't necessarily like get a traditional image of. But are there other like signatures um, that you can get um, without having to do active imaging that could help us know what, um, what some of these other things are? And um, I just wanted to show the data from this because I saw this recently. I thought, oh, this is too cool. I didn't even know you could do this. Um, so being uh, there's uh, so not just like visible sensors, but spectral and hyper um, hypertemporal sensors. And so 
Um, don't ask me what the data means too much. <laughs> but uh, so up on the plot, you can see here there's um, satellite spectra. So even just looking at the, um, this is on the left hand side. I don't know if you can read that, but it's intensity versus wavelength on the x axis. And um, even just like looking at um, what uh, spectral information satellites are reflecting. Um, they're, they're massively different depending on who made, made the bus or what kind of instruments they have on there. Um, and so here you can just see um, just in that, like the, signa the spectral signatures that they have um, uh, as from, uh, between different uh, satellites. And, and the same thing uh, uh, for the hypertemporal imaging, um, pretty, when, light is, when re light is reflected um, from the satellite to whatever sensor we have on the ground, um, the object vibrate, vibrates in a particular way based on the mechanical structure, and you get these unique signatures um, of the satellite just in looking at the hypertemporal data. And um, this can also uh, be used for trying to, you know, figure out, like, I guess, what is there. But in, in addition to that, um, it can also give you an indication on any state changes of the satellite um, or the health of the satellite as well. So these are kind of some things that we've been looking at. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, but imaging, I mean, back to the more traditional route, imaging um, for space domain awareness is a, is a hot topic of ours, um, it, particularly for satellites that are in uh, geostationary orbits. Um, so for a quick refresh, um, geostationary orbits are 35,000 kilometers away um, or 22,000 miles above Earth. And um, we have, uh, we as Earth, as, as humans, have trillions of dollars of assets in, in geo. Everything like from communication satellites to imaging satellites to you name it. And um, really, because it's so far away, there's not much option for problem identification. So um, you can't really see it very well. Um, to, the, to the extent where um, there, in April 2010, there was a communication satellite, Galaxy 15, that um, lost position control and just began drifting through the, through the geo belt and threatening a whole bunch of other uh, satellites. And uh, and they were still getting, um, it, the satellite could still relay information, but they couldn't, act, it wasn't responding to any controls. So it was effectively like a, a zombie set, as we like to call it. And, um, and, and the, the thing is, it was actually really shocking about how much, uh, oops, I don't know if that's going on. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, the thing was, uh, we, uh, we didn't really have a lot of information about what was happening. I mean, is it something that's gone wrong? Um, did it start spinning? Was it like, there was not a lot of information that could be, um, that could be gleaned just from the ground. I mean, it's, it's amazing like how little information we have on these systems once we launch them. And um, if, if it was in LEO orbit, you could just image it using a telescope on the ground. I mean, you could have a pretty good image from the ground of what your satellite, like what it looked like and try to get some information about what was happening just from imaging on the ground. Um, if we use uh, geo so far away that even if we use the largest telescopes that we could, um, it would just be like a smudge on the image. You don't get any information. I mean, it's like, yep, there, not like that's it. It doesn't look like a satellite on an image. It doesn't, you know, sound like a satellite. <laughs> um, so, uh, like being able to monitor what um, these like, yeah, billions of dollars of yeah, assets that we have up there is is of utmost importance. I mean, both for us and for the customers and the people that you know own the satellites. And um, and if if we wanted to get, um, I, I like this analogy. If we wanted to get a a Google Earth type resolution like that we have on Google Maps um, on a geo satellite. Um, we would require a greater than 70 meter aperture on the ground. And as you know, the next generation, you know, billion dollar endeavors for the next generation of uh, telescopes are 30 meter class. So this is not anywhere close to the resolution that we'd like to have um, on the ground. Um, so what can we do? And, uh, and so um, it's something that, uh, yeah, we ha that's been coming into particular popularity has been um, stellar interferometry. So this is the idea that um, instead of actually having to make a really, really big telescope um, that could give you the resolution that you want, what if instead you actually um, split up your telescopes? And so instead of having one, what if you took two smaller telescopes and put them a particular distance apart? And if you were able to combine the light in the right way, um, you could basically th synthesize an aperture that um, had the resolution of the distance between them, no longer the, the actual um, uh, mirror size itself now, but the distance between them suddenly becomes the thing that drives the resolution of the telescope. Um, and so uh, that's something that 
Um, Michael sent it uh, a while ago and uh, has still been kind of in popularity since then. Uh, in and, I guess in and out of popularity. Uh, but uh, it's kind of one way that we see of, of being able to maybe achieve this, um, our science objectives, I guess, um, in, in the coming years. And um, one thing with that, though, is that the beam combination hardware is very complex. So in, all, in order to um, actually get the, uh, the image formation to work out, um, what happens is, say, we're trying to image this star, and we have two uh, telescopes down at the bottom, one on the left, one on the right. And so what happens is the light from the star comes through this turbulent environment, um, gets different wavefront errors on, <laughs> on each different telescope, um, and then um, light from the star will hit one of the telescopes first due to the geometry. So if it's on one side, it'll just actually physically um, be received on one telescope first. And in order to um, interfere the two beams to form a white light interference fringe, um, you need to make sure that you delay the light um, from the telescope that it received first. So, so in this one, you can see that we have just a little delay line here, and that's to match the um, difference in the optical path between, um, in, in that the light takes between hitting the two telescopes. And so if you did all that right, um, then when you go to interfere the beams, then you should actually have an inter a white light interference fringe um, between, between them while well in practice. It's kind of hard. <laughs> um, so here, this is um, an animation that one of my colleagues made for me. Um, where let's uh, say we were trying to do this now to look at a geostationary satellite. So this is no longer like looking at a star, but let's say we're on the ground, we have two telescopes, and we want to and we want to look at try to image a geosat. Um, so basically, we're not we're uh, when you're when you're doing a stellar interferometer, you're not forming an image in the same way. You're effectively sampling the the Fourier transform of the um, intensity distribution, and so. Um, as light is either emitted by the object or is reflected from the sun, um, uh, reflected by the object, um, it diffracts and interferes, and the higher spatial frequencies are diffracting at wider angles. So there's this um, little cartoon on the left that shows if you have like a large feature, um, like that big gap that you see up in the top left, um, you get a narrow diffraction angle. Whereas if you had a small feature, a small spatial fe feature, then the light is um, uh, have, having a much wider diffraction angle. And so um, the image, uh, the, the actual um, object that you have then will have this crazy interference um, fringes within the diffraction pattern, as you see in the bottom. And so that's kind of what this um, bottom one here is illustrating. I don't know actually where my mouse went. Oh, there it is. Um, here, so that's basically the, um, the Fourier transform of this little guy. So spatial positions now become spatial frequencies in the Fourier plane. Um, so for a more complex object, um, such as a satellite, you have, you know, crazy high spatial frequency information, and um, you're, it's creating a much more complex pattern in the, in the UV plane or in the Fourier plane. Oops. Okay. So... Um, Basically, uh, light from from, or from different points of the satellite interfere, creating this complex Fourier transform of the object. So spatial dimensions, as I said, become spatial frequencies. And so um, in conventional imaging, um, let's say uh, we had, uh, we wanted to image this um, geosat. Here would be like a 200 meter um, diameter telescope, which would give us a highly resolved image of the satellite. This is kind of a simulation of what, how the satellite would look with a 200 meter uh, diameter telescope on the ground. And um, for reference, there is the Statue of Liberty, which ironically turns 130 years uh, old tomorrow. Um, and it's uh, 46 meters high. So it's, uh, that's one way of doing it. Um, and then there, even if we used a 30-meter telescope, um, sure, you can start seeing now that some higher frequency content is lost. I mean, you can kind of see something, but even for debugging purposes, I don't know how much that's going to tell you. You have to be a pretty good expert to pull something out of that, I think. Um, and then a six-and-a-half-meter six and uh, diameter telescope, eh, worse. Here's your one- to two-meter telescope. Uh, doesn't really look like much. So, um, however, if we take these two small telescopes, um, we can basically... Let me see if I can get that. So you collect light um, from two telescopes, and you create a single interference fringe uh, representing just one little slice of the Fourier plane. So that's this like, little bit that it's filled in now in the Fourier plane. So this is ideally the whole thing that we'd like to sample. And so if you can move your telescopes around at these different geometries, so different spacing is important and different um, uh, orientations is important, then you could actually map out, um, like kind of recover all of your spatial frequency information that you, that you need to recover to get the resolution that you want. 
And um, and then uh, you do you collect all the data, and assuming you've done it all right, um, you can do the Fourier transform, and you should be able to recover the image in post processing. And so for uh, for this, the um, that we would there's a predicted like half meter resolution from spot that's our facility in Santa Cruz, um, so that would be kind of comparable to a 40 meter um, conventional telescope. So that's kind of where we're trying to head with this. Um, so uh, sparse apertures, um, you know, can then effectively give you this better resolution that we're after, um, but they are pretty complex. So um, you do get um, the aperture resolution scaling with um, or the resolution scaling with the, um, the distance between the telescopes, and yes, you use, lose some um, some of the light gathering, like you lose some power just because you don't have the whole um, middle filled in, essentially. But that's okay. Um, what makes it hard, though, uh, for geo objects compared to just like doing um, stellar interferometry, like on a star or some other astronomical source, is that. Um, Geo objects are pretty dim, so you're kind of looking at reflected light. They're not like emitting anything themselves. They're just, you know, reflecting light. And, um, and they have complex asymmetrical structure, so that means you need a lot of spatial frequency, higher spatial frequency information to kind of see what you want to see. And um, they're stationary. Um, and that's a big problem because in stellar interferometry, you can actually rely on the rotation of the Earth to fill in some of the spatial frequency information or some of the points on the UV plane where geosats aren't moving anywhere. And so anytime you want to get a different kind of um, slice of the Fourier plane, you're just going to have to move your telescopes or build a whole bunch of telescopes in the right, in, in the right spot. Um, so... So this interferometric imaging concept is built on the Van Zernike theorem. And like I said, it measures the object's uh, 2D uh, Fourier transform. So you're really measuring the complex vis visibility. And if then w your interferometer is measuring the complex vis visibility. And then to get your image back, you have to take all the data and do all the math. And um, there are several different, I mean, there's, there's other ways of doing this. Um, like the one that I showed you is just this homodyne approach where you actually take the light, you use the, you use the delay, and then you re-interfere them again. You, um, you could do in intensity space. Um, although that has lower signal to noise. Um, heterodyne, heterodyne detection is a really interesting one um, where you wouldn't necessarily have to um, physically interfere the two beams that you collect. If you use like a local oscillator or some other source that's some other standard, um, you could interfere them both with the same standard and then, um, and then mix them, but they have different complications with that. Um, so currently the way that we've been approaching has been indirect detect, although there's definitely a lot of work to go or in the homodyne approach, but there's definitely a lot of work to go in, in heterodyne. And, um, and like I said before, the, the, um, because these objects are stationary, you really need um, a lot of baselines to be measured. So our approach has been to actually use a few telescopes that you actually just move around. Um, the Navy has, has a facility in Poi where they've actually built a whole bunch of um, um, stationary uh, telescopes that they have in a particular geometry. Um, so the technology uh, challenges with this uh, with this particular project um, is affordable adaptive optics. So um, because now you're getting um, the like because the light uh, is coming through the atmosphere again, uh, if you want to do you know anything remotely well, you want you want uh, wavefront correction. Um, the way that the spot facility works is that we're using optical fibers to, um, at once the light's been received at the telescope, then we transport it uh, back to where it'll be, um, where, to the delay line and then back to the beam combiner. We do that in optical fibers. Um, but you have to, uh, there's a lot of uh, challenges in, in, in um, doing that. Uh, basically, uh, you have dispersion in the fiber, like for different frequencies, you have problems. Um, fiber jitter, fiber mode matching losses. So doing it well, I mean, there's one thing of just doing it, and then there's like another level of doing it well, or, you know, get, actually making the system work, work really well. And so these are kind of some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, and, uh, it, I, you know, you could probably do better uh, doing everything, like, uh, in free space. But then as you move, like, as you need your um, telescopes to be moving around, uh, that becomes a lot more complicated. Like, the actual op optical system would probably be more complicated. So in the end, we just settled on fibers. And, um, and then the other uh, big technology challenge is having, like, the uh, global optical path difference or the OPD knowledge. And... Um, 
basically, uh, what happens though is, is you don't really have that knowledge because the, um, the light that comes to the two different telescopes, they have um, different uh, phase distortions due to the atmosphere. So you actually never really know the answer of like, um, unless you're me measuring the atmosphere directly, which we don't really know how to do yet. Um, and that's another problem for the students. <laughs> um, is like, unless you're doing that directly, uh, it's, it's hard to even know where that global, um, like, uh, point of where the, the OPD is equal in both of them because, or, or zero, I guess, because, uh, once you, like, you need to get that right to get an interference fringe between them. And so there's this kind of like this big unknown once you turn the whole system on, which is like, we don't even really know what the atmosphere has done from one side to the other. And you can measure it all the way, like, using a metrology system, uh, you can measure it, like, all the way from, from where you're, you're combining it, all the way back through the system up to the telescope, but, then after the telescope, it's like this big, you know, question mark, the big unknown of what did the atmosphere do to both of these? So where do I, how much do I need to actually really delay one or the other to, to get it right? Um, so kind of wrapping up on, on the spot system, um, we, uh, the goal here is to provide um, 100 meter um, aperture. So basically the baseline, the largest baseline would be around 100 meters. And that gives you that um, Resolution. Uh, the the when I first started at Lockheed back in 2014, they were just um, demonstrating the the first white light fringe on the system. So, um, using in the I band, they were able to um, get interferometric fringes um, going through the fiber system and everything, which was a pretty big achievement for us uh, with the new system. And future work includes um, upgrading to include the adapt adaptive optic systems, which Michael's group built. Um, actually starting to run the system because we, uh, when those fringes were taken, we didn't have the AO on there. And so um, this was like, you know, very, like, for very, very first results of, like, what <laughs> what we got. And, um, and then definitely so that you can um, get more uh, information and get better uh, imaging, uh, being able to um, image in different, um, different wavelengths. Um, so that would be, like, the next upgrade that we want to do. And um, then on to the, the thing that, um, that I've been thinking about and working on. Um, that's taking the same stellar interferometry techniques, but instead of trying to say, hey, how big can we build um, an imaging system? How, um, instead of like, how much better resolution can we get by going bigger and bigger, and what are these tricks that we can do to get better resolution? Um, it's kind of almost doing the opposite approach, where it's like, okay, we have this technology that we understand, um, and it should, in, you know, in principle work, and how can we take like a conventional imager um, and make it smaller? And like I said, so if like for a space-based system where size and weight and power is a huge deal, um, it's, you know, uh, trying, trying to say how can we apply this to just like take a problem or take, take a system that already works but just improve on that system. And so um, that's what uh, SPIDER is. It stands for Segmented Planar Imaging Detector for Electro-Optic Reconnaissance. I can never remember that. Um, and uh, I always need my cheat sheet when I'm doing that. Um, and so basically, it's kind of the exact same concepts um, as we did in the spot system or in the, in the ground-based um, stellar interferometric systems. Um, but now, um, uh, being able to uh, do all the sampling um, simultaneously. So instead of having to actually move our telescopes around, what if we just... Um, fill in this whole like little lenslet plane and basically you can see all those little lenslets would be like effective telescopes. Um, but you know, again, you're not getting the resolution. You're just trying to make the whole hardware imprint a lot smaller. And so again, you're doing, you're, you're imaging it in the, pu you're, you're detecting, you're, it's a pupil's plane detection versus a, an, an imaged plane um, detection. And this can, has the potential to give you a really low mass, um, low volume and maybe even reconfigurable system. Um, so if we take a closer look at what, uh, what the system looks like, um, so these uh, little blue, um, blue lines are the lenslet array. So these are tiny, tiny little lenslets. And then behind them are these photonic integrated circuits. And so basically, you're taking light from the scene, you're coupling it into these lenslets. Um, and then on the chip, on this photonic integrated circuit, which is really, really small, um, you can do all of these interferometric combinations um, on the chip and um, like spectral splitting, beam combination, all the stuff that you want to do, phase shifting, all of that can happen on a really, really small um, piece of photonics. And um, so here, again, the same thing, your, um, your effective resolution then is limited by your maximum baseline. Um, so that's the different distance from basically, you know, one side to the other. 
Um, right now, we're not doing anything where we're like crossing chips or anything like that. So basically, just the one um, chip would kind of give you your resolution. And then um, you can hook up as many of those lenslet pairs that you want. So because the, um, the photonic integrated circuits do this so well, and, um, and they can put you know thousands of these little structures onto such a small area, um, it's a really powerful, um, powerful way of uh, creating an imaging interferometer where um, suddenly you have this like huge, uh, yeah, advantage where instead of moving all of your baselines and everything around, um, you can just sample all of these uh, different combinations of the lenslet pairs um, simultaneously. So, um, kind of the key features you need like um, here we have like low loss waveguides, uh, phase, sh phase shifters that will need to actually step the interferic. Um, um, interferometric uh, fringe along to sweep out the phase basically and then um, beam combiners to actually interfere the light to give you the interference fringe um, and then arrayed uh, waveguide gratings for spectral splitting. So again kind of the order of operations of what's happening on our chips. Um, we have the light coming in through these lenslets, it's going through the heater, it's um, getting, they're, they're getting combined and then they go through the spectral splitting and then we're uh, measuring basically that complex uh, visibility and then from that we take all the data and do do the post-processing and um, uh, the the questions that you know kind of people care about is like you know what's the field of view how does this really work for you know an imaging system how, what can we expect um, so the the coupling efficiency of the, the PIC, PIC is um, an acronym for tonic integrated circuit uh, so the PIC is um, the coupling efficiency basically varies with the field field angle and um, the field of view is determined, like, if you back propagate the, the waveguide mode into the object space, that um, basically tells you your field of view. And if, uh, once we start getting fancy with these, the way that you could ex um, extend the field of view of your system is by, by packing a whole bunch of little extra waveguides behind each lenslet. So you're, I'm behind each lenslet, you could, um, the lenslet could, could still, you know, focus the light down over into, like, multiple waveguides now, not just not just one, but we haven't gotten that far yet. Um, the the spatial resolution. So again, your um, your baseline, your your maximum baseline, basically gives you your um, uh, the the spatial sets the spatial resolution of the imager, and it also um, determines the cutoff uh, spatial frequency. And so the way that we have it um, to to basically give us the kind of um, image quality that we want. Um, as it turns out, you don't actually have to hook up every single lenslet pair. Um, you don't, I mean, you could get some redundancy if you wanted, but um, you, you know, like every of these two that you hook up, that's the, just like the same spatial frequency. And so you don't need to do that for all of them. So you kind of, um, there's a, a bit of an art to figuring out um, what, uh, what lenslet pairs that you need. And so that's um, what this is, basically the Fourier sample density. Um, and so the, um, Basically, the baseline, so the, the different um, lenslet pairs that you choose, and the spectral channels are chosen basically so you can get the, the, the sampling that you want. And so um, you'll notice that fewer spectral channels are needed at shorter baselines just through the way that it fills in the UV plane. And so um, for the system that we're building, our lenslets are, sm well, they uh, lenslet manufacturers call them big lenslets, but we call them pretty small. They're, they're um, 0.72 millimeters in diameter. Um, and so um, the maximum baseline for this system is uh, 21 millimeters, and we're kind of around the 15, 15 nanometer range, but yeah, from 1300 to 1700 or something like that. And the field of view of this would then be like 5 milliradians, which is, I guess, big for astronomers. <laughs> um, and um, this, you know, something, uh, well, I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, this is uh, a simulation. So um, right now in the lab, we're, we're kind of only doing tests on just one of those um, photonic integrated circuits with the one lens array around. But if you put them in that geometry, in that radial kind of like the bicycle wheel geometry, um, you could expect to get something like this. So where you're simultaneously sampling all of these different spatial frequencies. And so you kind of just do like a one shot and then all of that spatial, inf um, spatial frequency information is captured. And then um, you do your image reconstruction and you can hope to come, back, come out with something that looked remotely like the, the thing that went in. And um, so this, was a, this is a joint um, DARPA and UC, uh, UC Davis effort. 
Um, the DARPA first started funding this in 2014 under the CME program, and um, the uh, the university that's been um, doing all of our design, fabrication, and testing of the photonic integrated circuits is uh, UC Davis, uh, Professor Yu. And um, so in 2014, under the CME program, we uh, fabricated a four-channel or two-baseline uh, photonic integrated circuit. So we were using uh, much larger lenslets. In that case, we were using three-millimeter lenslets. And um, we only had, we had two baselines, basically a five-millimeter baseline and a 20-millimeter baseline. And um, we did just very uh, early proof of concept demonstrations, so showing that we actually could use a pick, get the interferometric combination working the way that you expect. expect. Um, here that the visibility would change as a function of um, correctly as a function of the slit, slit width that we did for these uh, measurements. And um, we also showed that the spectral splitting on the chip worked. So now we're in our second um, stage of DARPA funding um, under the uh, Spider Zoom program. And again, with uh, UC Davis. And uh, they've changed their material. So they were using um, silicon before for the photonic integrated circuit material. And um, now they've changed to silicon nitride. And um, that's given us like 100 times reduction in, in the space that it took up. So before, it was kind of the round of the size of, I don't know, like a floppy disk or something, um, our first generation chip. And now it's like, like a smaller than a mail stamp, um, but still has like the same. And, and in fact, instead of only having um, four ear, you know, four channels on it, now we have um, two, 103, I think. Um, yeah, so it's um, it's it's pretty impressive. So uh, basically, now the functionality on the chip is kind of just getting better and better. So now we're really getting into like the dense um, dense arrays um, that we want or that we need to be able to do any kind of good imaging with this. And um, uh, so here, um, when they do these, when they do these runs, you can see that this is a six-inch wafer, that big disk, and there's 24 of those devices. So those would be like 24 of the spokes on the wheel, um, all fitting on that six-inch wafer. So once you like laid them out. And um, so we're actually doing two versions, um, what we call a low-resolution chip and a high-resolution chip. Um, so for the low-resolution chip, like I was saying, the maximum interferometer baseline would be 21 millimeters. And then um, we have 12 baselines that then get, um, some of which get split into 18 different spectral bins. Um, for the high-resolution chip, we actually just use the same um, chip, like the same uh, low-resolution chip, um, but to get a better, higher resolution, basically, again, to extend out your baseline, um, you can just add in this kind of uh, fan-in fan chip, as we call it, and it basically just couples to the, like, you know, the, the brains of the chip, if you will, and just gives you um, a, a much better resolution now because your baselines are so much further apart. Um, so we're, I wish uh, I had a, um, a little bit of better data to show. We've been working on this, and uh, things have gone a little slower than we expected. Um, but we have, um, Davis um, did the first interference uh, fringe measurements, so basically showing that once you change the heater phase, or once you change the heaters, then the, the phase of the fringes actually move, which is good. Um, here's a picture of the chip itself on the top left. Um, it's so small, like I said, that like whenever you kind of are looking at it to do anything, we look through the microscope. Um, it, like whenever we're trying to inject light, like from a fiber to go through it to do some um, throughput measurements or anything like that. Even just knowing where on the chip you need to be is hard because there, um, there's you know there, I think we have 206 like output waveguides um, that we actually put onto the camera. And so when you want to do anything like that, just even knowing where on the chip you are is a little bit of a problem. I spent a lot of time looking through microscopes in the last few months. Um, and so we're now trying to actually put this so that we can do a full imaging demo. Um, the way that we're going to do it is we're only going to use uh, one chip. So instead of building that whole 37 chip array, and, like the bicycle wheel, um, you really don't need to do that. We could do it in the way that the ground-based systems operate, where you actually just build one, and then you can just either spin the image or spin that, essentially. And so you can kind of get all the different spatial frequency information that you need. It's kind of a longer collection period, and eventually that's not what we want to do. But just to demonstrate the, the proof of concepts, that's what we want. Um, so our very first uh, results that we've taken in our test bed at, um, at the ATC um, is uh, just like the initial fringe measurement. So we have a really, really basic scene generator at the moment. Um, uh, like, or it's, yeah, basically a point source. And so we have um, a broadband light source. Um, I, I put it in red here, but it's really like, you know, white light. It's a broadband source. Um, coming out of a fiber collimator, it's going 
um, from a mirror, then to a steering mirror, a fast steering mirror that we can control the angle. And then into the lens array, onto the photonic integrated circuit, into the photonic integrated circuit. And then um, all the output waveguides we're basically looking at on the camera. So these are like the interfered beams now that have been spectrally divided as well. And um, so as you, um, like, it, this would essentially be giving you um, the same response, like if we were to translate a point source around in our, in our image, the way that the interference fringes work on the different baselines you would get this um, response. Um, but the way that we've done it here is actually just introduce like piston in, uh, piston in our wavefront by um, using a, a steering mirror and basically just controlling the angle. And so what you see here is this is um, looking at, like at the camera data um, the different baselines, you can see that like different baselines have different, like the fringe frequency of basically of these is different. And so um, that is dependent on the baseline length, um, the rate at which you're like, sampling the fringe, I guess. And so, um, good. That's like our very, very first results. Um, and the next step then is to actually um, take out the really basic scene generator or take out um, the collimator and put in our scene generator so we can actually start doing um, bar targets or more interesting sources than like a point source um, because that's not a very exciting object. Uh, we really want something that's going to um, show it a little bit better. So um, to, to do that, the, this is a scene generator that we have. This is like these little telescopes um, or these little mirrors, I'm sorry. I think it has like a focal length or uh, NEF number of 28. Uh, for the whole system and so um, what we have is like a white light source and then we have um, a whole bunch of different um, options on a linear stage so as we're doing cali um, calibrations like as we need to go to different sources and stuff we can actually change what's being injected or what what the photonic integrated circuit is looking at um, what what light is going into that system um, so our grand scale with this is to um, really provide a low cost um, imaging sensor and um, I would say that spider, like our spider radial blade design, is, is kind of the middle step of where we'd like to go with this. Um, in the future, we'd really like the lenslets to be integrated on the chip um, because even doing that lenslet to chip alignment, oh, <laughs> it's not easy. Um, it takes a while. And uh, so that, that's like one thing that we would love to get rid of, that, that whole process. And, um, and then also like um, being able to put the detectors um, onto the chip as well. That would be ideal. So, um, and then instead of having all of these different printed chips that you have to um, mechanically mount and everything, if we could start doing more of like a 3D, uh, 3D waveguides where um, in, instead of the, the waveguides kind of being in this plane, like as you go back, they would actually go down in the third dimension. And so you could ha build your, your lenslets and then your um, interferometer uh, arrays all in a, like a single chip is ideally what we'd like to do. Um, so this is kind of like in closing our, our idea for how um, a system like this would look. So it's like, again, like kind of like your Google Earth um, equivalent where instead of needing a really large, um, uh, really large mirror or t uh, telescope, uh, you could get similar resolution um, but with a much smaller uh, payload. So um, here is uh, the list of people, um, mainly the optics people. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but of the people that, I, um, that I'm working with and our collaborators at Davis. And I will take any of your questions. Questions? Go ahead. So 